Welcome to the Monkey Off My Backlog podcast, the podcast where we exercise our pop culture demons by tackling our media to-do lists one week at a time. I'm your host, Andy Bowman, and with me are my co-hosts, Dr. Sam Morris. Hello. And Tessa Suela. Hello. This week, Sam dives into a British miniseries, Tessa lives it up with the Greek pantheon, and I investigate Kurosawa's procedural crime drama. We are going to be talking about what we've been catching up on uh, this week. So, Tessa, what did you catch up on? What did you cover? Well, Andy, in honor of the recently announced series on Disney+, Plus, I chose The Lightning Thief, which is the first book in the Percy Jackson and the Olympians series. What is is The Lightning Thief about? Uh, Assume that I am somebody who did not read books for fifth graders in college like I actually did (laughs) well it is a middle grade book um it is uh well I'll give you the premise first and then I'll give you some of the the details about it um so the book is basically about Percy Jackson who is a troubled sixth grader who discovers early in the novel that the Greek gods are real and have been living in America for quite some time he learns that his father is Poseidon. This is very early on. None of this is is, is major spoilers. And that uh, he is a demigod. And that there's this whole supernatural world that he did not know existed. Um, but there's trouble amongst the gods, which threatens to destroy the human world. So Percy and his new friends must go on a quest to save everybody. Um, this book was originally published in 2005. Um, like I said, it's the first book in uh, five. There's five of them, five ser- in the series. Um, there's also a couple of spin-off series. Um, it's by Rick Reardon. Have we? Have I think we we've decided Reardon. I yeah. Think we have landed we on agreed that. that that's how? I I know that there was a I, debate for a while. I always say Reardon. <laughs> right, well, I like it. It gives a little it flair. Yeah. That is um, the first time I've been able to roll my R's. So there you go. We're proud of you. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, the other, I know that they, he has also written other spin-off series in the same universe that are about other pantheons, um, as well. And uh, it's sort of a middle grade cross between American Gods and Harry Potter. That's probably the best description I could give you of what it is if you're looking to anchor it within sort of middle grade young adult um, traditions. Now, is uh, Rick uh, Riordan, is he uh, as uh, horribly transphobic as uh, J.K. Rowling? No, I don't think so. I don't. I haven't really followed Rick Riordan. A... <laughs> I, I, I don't want to say anything because I feel like somebody's going <laughs> to write in and say, but he said one time. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, did, I, did I present a paper at a conference about homophobia in one of the later books? Did you? I did. Oh, yeah, I you did. did. I, did. I, I totally for- I actually did not remember that. But until is that just the now. author being homophobic or creating characters who are homophobic, or is it both the same thing? But anyway, uh, that's several books in the future. It, Don't worry about it. It's always a it is always a question. Um no homophobia in the lightning thief. Um okay. Yeah. Now uh so this book, uh clearly not a difficult read. Uh, is there a reason why you have not gotten around to reading it yet? I, you know, it, like I said, it came out in 2005, um, so I was 15, so I was a little bit older than the target audience. Um, I also, as, as will come up many times in this podcast, uh, came from a family that was semi-suspicious of books about magic or magical elements. This is when I was 15. They, they totally relaxed their rules later. Um, and so, like, it just wasn't a book that was really on my radar at the time, um, but I wanted to read it. I, I mean, I have wanted to read it for a while. It's been on my list for a while because it has such a massive fan base. Uh, people love these books. There's a lot of, um, especially female fans, um, that, that really love these books and, and read them even when they're not in the target age group. Um, I know a lot of people who were reading them in their early 20s, and we have a lot of mutual friends that also are huge fans of this series as well. I think there were also two movie adaptations of them. Yes. several years ago i don't think that they were they're super not, well received they're not good <laughs> but um but yeah so it's been on my radar for a while i'm a big fan of reimaginings of mythology in novels and fantasy um i'm i'm i've been a student of mythology both greek norse uh what have you for a while 
And so uh, I, I've always just been kind of interested in this genre. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, uh, are there, I, I mean, how did you feel after reading it? What's is, was it good? Was it bad? You know, go ahead and give me what you thought about this book. Cause, uh, you know, uh, I don't do much reading nowadays, but I remember thinking back on uh, certain elements of uh, children's books as uh, being a little problematic sometimes. Yeah, so um, I recently saw a, um, I re recently watched an interview that Neil Gaiman did with N.K. Jemison for the Fisher Center. Um, and he basically, they were talking about reading, rereading childhood books, things that you read as a child that you then read as an adult. And uh, he pointed out that the book that you read as an adult is different than the book you read as a child. Um, I did not read The Lightning Thief as a child, um, but I definitely had a different reading experience of The Lightning Thief than I think your average middle grader would have. Um, there are some very good elements to it. I did very much enjoy reading it. Um, Rick Reardon is a very good writer. Um, it's a really great first person point of view. Um, I had that very rare experience of actually hearing Percy Jackson's voice while I was reading it. Um, you know, he, he creates this character that's so well-rounded and you can just, you can hear him basically um, as he's narrating this story. Um, he, he brings up a lot of questions about like what makes a kid troubled and um, he has ADHD, which is very well represented in the book. It's a very fresh take on this Greek mythology, which is really cool. Um, you kind of look forward to seeing the different gods and the different mythical creatures and uh, characters sort of in this new Americanized format while still being very recognizable as those characters themselves. However, um, I think that the reason why my experience maybe wasn't so whole wholeheartedly great was that... Rick Reardon is writing a series about a set of myths that's very much centered around rape and sexual assault. Um, anyone who has read any Greek myths knows that that's sort of a central element of those particular myths. And so it's just, it's, uh, he, Rick Reardon does his best to write around um, those things in those stories because he is writing for a younger audience. However, as an adult, you can still kind of, you, it, there's just some very uncomfortable moments where you can tell he's writing around it. Um, there's a line really early on in the novel where Percy Jackson talks about being in a foot race with some nymphs, but he can't outrun them because they've had so much practice running away from the lovesick gods. And a middle grader is not going to know what that means. Like, they're just going to read past that and think, oh, cool, like foot races with nymphs. But as an adult, you kind of get this like, ugh feeling in your stomach. Um, there's also a story that is sort of retold that's definitely about sexual assault in the original myth, I won't get into it, that he reframes in a way that's a little bit problematic. Um, so yeah, I think there, there was definitely some really great things. I really enjoyed the book, but definitely some weird moments as an adult um, reading something that was clearly, clearly there are large portions of it that are cut out <laughs> for, for ch child readers or for middle grade readers. Right, right. Uh, I also remember that there's a um, can't remember if it if it's this book or not, but there there's like a habit to kind of uh, Americanify the names of the characters, right? Uh, Mister D. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's, there's like Mister D. I think, I think Medusa shows up in one of them. And she does show up in the first one, doesn't she? That's actually the one I was talking about. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they they kind of yeah. do something to the story of Medusa that I didn't appreciate. Um, he's just he's not interested in interrogating, you know, some of these issues because they're not really appropriate for a middle grader to interrogate. Um, and that doesn't mean that he doesn't, you know, try to examine some of the problems with the Greek myths. I mean, a lot of the tension in the the novel comes from Percy's sort of resistance to the callousness of the of the gods and sort of the way that they're they only care about their own problems um but yeah i mean and again like i don't think a middle grader would notice this at all i mean he he does a pretty good job of knowing his audience just a, as an adult if you're aware of these things you're gonna feel a little weird at times now uh are these greek gods uh worse or better than the greek gods of uh god of war the video game 
I have never played the video game. Oh, oh, it is. Uh, so. <laughs> well, may- maybe you'll be talking about that later. Uh, maybe. Uh, I should put episode. that on my list. Uh, no, actually, I think that one's been on my list. I don't think I've had access to it. Um, okay. But oh. I, uh, I, they're not... They're not that that is the one thing I would I did appreciate about this is that he doesn't try to sugarcoat it. He doesn't try to make them Americanized heroic, right? They're still very Greek. They're still very self-involved. Um they still just kind of like have fights. They I mean the whole premise of the book is that they're all fighting with each other <laughs> over, you know, somebody did something to someone else and and that other person's feelings got hurt and they have children all the time, and you know it, it's it is still very Greek, even though he's refreshed it in a very American way. Cool, cool. So uh, overall, uh, recommend, don't recommend. Uh, we need to come up with like a cute, uh, like a cutesy way of saying we recommend or don't we recommend. recommend. Uh, we should put this monkey on someone else's back. Ah, <laughs> um, pass the monkey. Yep. Pass the monkey we along. Will ha- I would recommend this to anyone who likes reading about mythology. Um, I would recommend it to anyone who wants to find something that they could read with their middle grader. I actually think this would be a really good book to share with your middle grader. So you're going to pass the monkey to adult and children alike. Yeah, like I would. And again, like uh, I really don't think a middle grader is going to notice some of the things that he writes around. I think it's going to be definitely more of an adult thing. Um, but it is a good, it's good. I, I'm planning on reading the rest of them eventually. I'll let you all know how that goes. All right. Uh, well, Tessa, right. why don't you go ahead and pass it along? Yeah. All right. Tell me about the monkey you had this week, Sam. Me? Well, the monkey that I had for this week, uh, is the 2018 BBC miniseries, A Very English Scandal. I feel like there should always be a gasp <gasps> after a very English scandal. Well, it, it has to be a very restrained gasp because... It can't be like the southern lady gasp, no, though. It can't be like, oh English. my. this Like, we can't talk about our feelings. Yeah. yeah. I'll try to find a, uh, a royalty-free gasp to put in there. All right. All right. <laughs> so, uh, this is a... As I said, it's a, it's a BBC miniseries. It's a three-episode thing. So, it's a, it's a three-hour investment. Um... It's got some big names behind it. Uh, stars Hugh Grant. So there you go. There's your there's your big marquee name late, there. Late career Hugh Grant. A late career Hugh Grant. I I thought that Hugh Grant was done with acting, but he's been making a resurgence recently. Yes. Well, you know, if you saw the recent film, as all three of us did, uh, The Gentleman by Guy Ritchie, you know that all late career Hugh Grant projects are not created the same. Wiser words were never spoken. Yes. A very English scandal was, as I will say more about, good. Uh, The gentleman was not. (laughs) Uh, So Hugh Grant, but also Ben Wishaw. And if you don't know the name Ben Wishaw, you probably know him as... Paddington! Hooray! Yes, he is Paddington Bear. You might also, if you're a James Bond fan, recognize him as Q. Uh, from Quantum of Solace, not Quantum of Solace, from Skyfall Forward. He's also Richard the uh, the Second in The Hollow Crown. Oh. Yeah. All right. Obscure Obs- Ben Wishaw reference yeah. for the win. Lots of, I mean, he's a big time British miniseries actor. He's also the lead in London Spy, which I haven't gotten to yet. Uh, the Hour was a two series, a uh, two season series. Um, anyway. But also written by, uh, Very English Scandal was written by Russell T. Davies of early Doctor Who fame. Uh, he uh, left Doctor Who amid a lot of, admit a lot of criticism. Uh, people said, well, why don't you just let Stephen Moffat take over? He's a much better writer. That was a thing people said once upon a time. Let Stephen Moffat have this project. He would do better than the person who's currently doing it. We all said it. <laughs> There's a time machine moment for you. Uh, but Russell T. Davies is responsible for Eccleston and Tennant, who he is also responsible for all the good, bad, and ugly that is Torchwood. Uh, so he wrote A Very English Scandal. Uh, the director of A Very English Scandal, Stephen Frears, uh, at, at, who you may or may not have heard of, but he is a big influence in my life because he directed the original film adaptation of High Fidelity. 
Um, but he also directed Dirty Pretty Things, The Queen, Philomena, Lawrence Foster Jenkins. You know, if there's a prestige British movie that gets nominated for an Oscar, it's a 50-50 shot. He directed it. So this is basically like the royalty of British yes. miniseries. Yes. And so they all got together to dramatize a true story about Jeremy Thorpe, a Liberal Party MP and eventually leader of the Liberal Party between the years 1965 and 79. Uh, Jeremy Thorpe uh, begins a relationship with a man named Norman Joseph, and this relationship comes back to haunt him over the years. Um, the, the show gets into issues of uh, the intersection of homosexuality and British politics. It spans a time period. Uh, in 1965, homosexuality was still illegal in, uh, in Britain. By the time we get to the end of that time span, it is legalized, although certainly still stigmatized. Um, so we see how that impacts, you know, scandal and, you know, the potential downfall of an important British politician. Um, we also see it becomes a law show for a while. It becomes a, a comical murder plot at some point. Um, it's a really interesting, interesting uh, story. So why did you want to watch it? Like, why was it on your list? Well, it was on my list because, uh, as, as, as you mentioned, this is, this is like British miniseries royalty here. One of the great things about watching British drama, um, the more you watch, the more you start to see faces and names over and over again, uh, particularly on the BBC. Uh, there is a, a, a family of actors, and that's, that's very comforting. Um, I began watching British dramas mm, around 2003. Uh, the very first one I ever watched was a miniseries called Bodies. Um, Basically, Britain was doing The Resident uh, or any other kind of hospital show where they take on serious themes and ideas way before we were. Um, uh, it was created by a guy named Jed Mercurio, who also created uh, 2018's Bodyguard, which you can find on Netflix, which is a gr another great miniseries. Um from there, I also started watching uh, one of my other favorites is MI5, um, which starred Matthew McFadden, who you might know as Darcy from the Kira Knightley Pride and Prejudice, uh, David Oyelowo, who played uh, MLK in the movie Selma, and Keely Hawes, who is one of the stars of Bodyguard. Basically, you should watch Bodyguard. This is also a stealth recommendation for uh, Bodyguard <laughs> as well. Um, so this is what got, you know, I'm always on the lookout for the next big British thing that people are talking about that's got some of the names I recognize. And so A Very English Scandal was one of those. So really sight unseen, I added it to my list. So why did it take you so long to watch it since you're such a huge fan of, of the British drama? Well, as we will talk about over the weeks to come, it's, it's hard to check things off our list sometimes. And the way that I check off a lot of these miniseries is on plane flights when I travel. Um, and so last year it was on my list. I ended up watching a couple of other things instead. And I thought, well, I'll just get to this one next year. And then we didn't travel anywhere this year because the pandemic happened. So I thought now is a really good time. This is a good way to start off the podcast with something that has been on my list. And I have been really wanting to get it off of the list. All right. So what was your experience with this show? So first of all, the, the writing is very good. After all, it's not Moffat, so it would be good writing. <laughs> um, it, it was good. Uh, ben Wishaw is amazing, as he is in everything. Um, he, he really brings this character of Norman uh, Joseph to life. Um, every time Norman Joseph says all he wants is his national insurance card, you're j you sit there and you go, just give the man his national insurance card. Like, why make this man's life difficult? Um, incidentally, uh, the the real Norman Joseph is is still alive, and he has a real take on this miniseries, which I won't share because I don't want to spoil it. But you know, you'll learn something if you watch this. It's a good historical document. It is based on a true story, um, and it is a limited time investment. It's three hours. It's on Netflix. Uh, it's on Amazon Prime. Excuse me. Ready to go. 
ready to be consumed, I, I certainly recommend it. So you would put this monkey on somewhere else's I would pass back. the monkey. Okay. Pass the monkey. All right. And speaking of passing, I'm going to pass it over to Andy, who's going to tell us about, well, you're going to tell us about some highs and lows, right? Yes, some highs and lows. Some some very, very good highs and some uh, still very good lows. Uh, I watched Akira Kurosawa's movie, High and Low. I am not familiar with that one. Uh, tell us about it. All right. So, uh, High and Low is a movie that takes place in, I would say, early 1960s Japan. It's it's clearly very uh, contemporary. A movie came out in, I think, 1963. So, probably 1960 Japan. Uh, it is about a man who is running a shoe factory. And uh, he... He has an opportunity. I'm trying to think of the right way to phrase this here. He he takes a gamble. Uh, he chases a gambler's high of mortgaging everything he owns to, to get enough money to be able to buy a controlling share in the company. And, and this is going to go very well. Everyone's going to be happy. Right, right. End of movie. End of movie. <laughs> yes. Right. So he he has his uh his fifty, it's fifty million yen. Um. He's he's about to do that. He's a, uh, if he fails to take over the company, he will be kicked out of a controlling share of the company, or he will just be kicked out of the company. So very high stakes for him. He has been working at this factory for, uh, thirty years. He. He knows shoes. He wants to make good, high-quality shoes. So he gets the money. He arranges the deal. And right before he can send his, uh, you know, uh, send his underling with the money to, to go make the purchase, he uh, gets a phone call. And the phone call uh, lets him know that his son has been kidnapped. There is a... Uh, a ransom, a, a ransom for his son. And this man, uh, his name's Gondo. He immediately says, okay, I will, I will pay. I, I, you know, I, I will end up risking my entire future, uh, even more, you know, taking a bigger gamble, trying to figure out where I can get this money even further. This is going to bankrupt me, but I'm going to pay the ransom to get my son. And after he is done s- Saying that to himself and to his wife and and to his partner, his son walks in the door. And as it turns out... Gasp. Yeah, we have his, another gasp. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and as it turns out, his son was not kidnapped, but his chauffeur's son, who is uh, best friends with his son, was. And this movie then becomes a a tense... Uh, exploration about uh, about that that premise you know he he clear he was about to pay to have his own to save his own son but now it's not his son he uh he immediately calls the police and uh it's about the investigation uh of how to get this boy back and what happened and who kidnapped him and why and uh it is a very very well structured procedural movie. It's a it's a really interesting question. By the way, I am by no means a financial advisor, but essentially, is your child worth half a million dollars? I guess that's a that's an interesting question. Now, is the ha, have you have you much experience with Kurosawa films before this one? Uh, I mean, I I watched uh, Seven Samurai back when I was like. 13 you you know you know uh i i don't really consider that having watched it because it's been uh almost 17 years okay kind of a thing so yeah i so you i would say that this, this is your... my first yeah so you would say this would be your first then is right that... this is my first kurosawa movie okay uh, why why pick this one okay uh this movie it was pitched at it was explained to me in the um the Top 10 uh, crime movies, YouTube video I watched. It was pitched to me as a kind of like a single setting movie, right? 
it's a movie that takes place all within this room where it's it's all about this choice of this man whether or not to basically pay for his his chauffeur's uh, son's life uh you know working with the police making this this choice uh he you know gondo san is in a very very tough spot really really tough and i'm a big fan of any movie that is unique about its setting right that has some kind of weird gimmick about its setting i love single room movies i i love single take movies basically single anything movies i'm probably sold so Uh, it 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 sounds like to me like it's a combination and this would be a really weird movie it sounds like a combination of the alfred hitchcock movie rope and the mel gibson gary sinise vehicle ransom which would be a very uh, odd movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as it turns out, that 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 is how it was pitched to me. Okay. Um, it it actually is not that. Uh, it only spends a certain amount of time. You know, the since we're not going past the first third, it only spends about the first third of the movie. Uh, the movie is two and a half hours long, by the way, but it does not feel two and a half hours long. You were, uh, you know, what's the phrase? Uh. You pay for the whole seat, but you're only using the edge. Uh, this is a tense movie, but it is very much mostly a police procedural. It is a movie about a police force as a whole going about its police force job. And that's unusual for Kurosawa, right? I mean, I've only seen a few of his films, but generally they tend to, to be more samurai-oriented, right? Right, right. So this and... would be kind of a departure for him. Yeah, and uh, Kurosawa has his favorite leading man, uh, Mifune, as Gondo-san. And the similarities between a samurai from the 17th, 18th century and Gondo are very apparent. He is a man very much driven by honor. He definitely positions himself, and he just can't help but be intimidating. But more importantly, this is a... One of the first times where I watched a movie, I've been like, oh, this is how actual police work would be done. Uh, this is, it, it does a lot of really interesting things. Like the first phone call or the first phone call that the police are in on, you know, that the police have recorded with the kidnapper. It doesn't actually show you the phone call as it's happening. It shows it shows it to you as the police are re-listening to it, right? So there's this moment where they've had a little bit of time to process it. It doesn't feel very like uh, a Sherlock Holmesy or Poirot or you know a- any of the uh, any of those things where like the the epiphanies happen immediately. You can see the entire police force working on this and listening to it, and also uh, really quick. It is a movie where I would not say that, you know, the the police force or the kidnapper make a specific mistake, right? These are both high-level chess players playing at the height of their game. Sounds sounds like you want to pass this monkey as well. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, High and low is great. There's tons of social commentary, you know, obviously the main character is a, a millionaire. Um, uh, it's, it's a big deal. Uh, you know, the high and low actually refers to how high he is in society and how low the, uh, the kidnapper is. Uh, definitely watch this. It is, it is tense. Uh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just do yourself a favor. Watch it. This, this monkey gets passed on <laughs> to you, dear listeners. So have fun with that. Tune in next week. I'll be going over the video game Event Zero. Sam? Uh, I'll be taking a look at the deluxe re-release of the seminal debut album by Smashing Pumpkins, Gish. Tessa? And I will be watching, for the very first time, Judgment Free Zone, Jaws. Sam? Dr. Sam, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Sam underscore Morris 9. 
And you can find me on Letterboxd as Archie Leach 9 Tessa, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Swela, S-W-E-H-L-A, Tessa. And you can also find me on Letterboxd under the same name. All right. You can find me on Twitter at Hebrews Pale Ale and Letterboxd as well. You can find us on Twitter at Monkey Backlog. You can email us at monkeyoffmybacklog at gmail.com. Our theme song, Hot Shot by Scott Holmes, can be found at scottholmesmusic.com. Please rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Um, that's all we have today. Get that monkey off your back. We're going to have to figure out an actual catchphrase. Yep. I, I, I like that one a little bit. Yeah.